What's up, everybody? Tara Wellman here. And in case you missed it, Paul Goldschmidt is officially a St. Louis Cardinal, at least for 2019. And Luke Weaver, Carson Kelly, Andy Young, and a draft pick to be chosen later are now Arizona Diamondbacks. And with news like that, I couldn't wait till the new episode of Winter Wonderland comes out this weekend. I wanted to talk about it now. So we're going to call this a Winter Wonderland short. And joining me for this short episode is John Gambadoro, who's a sports talk show radio host in Arizona. On the Phoenix radio waves, though, he just goes by Gambo. I imagine it has been a whirlwind of a week covering the Arizona Diamondbacks with the Corbin signing, then of course with the flurry of rumors about Paul Goldschmidt, then of course concluding today with the finalized trade between the Cardinals and the Diamondbacks. I guess let's just start here. What's your initial reaction to this trade? I think the Diamondbacks needed to do it. Unfortunately, they're going to start a rebuild right now, and there's more to come. I mean, A.J. Pollock is going to leave this organization, sign somewhere else, and they are trying to trade Zach Ranke as well. Paul Goldschmidt is one of the greatest players in franchise history. Franchise hasn't been around a long time, but he's one of the greatest players. He's a homegrown player, but with only one year remaining on his contract and the fact that he's probably going to get paid a lot of money in free agency, the Diamondbacks just couldn't risk holding on to him. They had to get something for him better than a compensatory pick, which is what they got for Patrick Corbin. So they had to trade him. We knew it was coming. It's been so interesting to me trying to watch people make an attempt to place a value on either Goldschmidt for one year or the possible prospects and major league caliber players that they could get in return. I think I know I was a little bit surprised by the names that did finally end up in this deal, um, maybe partly because there had been so many names thrown around as possibilities. So what was it like on your end trying to kind of get a feel for what a legitimate return could be for Goldschmidt at this point? Well, I had talked with the Astros. I had talked with the Yankees. I had talked with several teams that were interested in Paul Goldschmidt. And I kind of got the feeling that it wasn't going to be a gigantic blockbuster top prospect trade. Because of the fact that he's, he's, you know, he's a rental player. I mean, the Cardinals don't know if they're going to be able to keep him. He's nine months away from free agency. He'd be crazy to sign a deal with the Cardinals right now. He needs to play one year with the Cardinals and then see what free agency offers. Maybe he remains with them, but maybe he gets outbid. Maybe the Yankees outbid the Cardinals. So he's got to get to free agency. His last contract with the Diamondbacks was such a low-level contract. I mean, the production compared to what he's put up, I mean, a lot of people feel he left about $100 million on the table with the last deal that him and his agent negotiated, which was terrible. It's just a terrible deal based on his production. So I think that we all knew that the Diamondbacks were going to get players, but we didn't think they were going to get back top prospects. Now, I had Mike Hazen, the general manager of the Diamondbacks, on my show just a short time ago after the trade. And Mike Hazen told me that it absolutely played a major factor in being able to get back top prospects, the fact that he only has one year left on his deal. That was that seemed to be the way most uh, in the Cardinals world felt about it as well, that this was it's kind of a risky move in a different way than perhaps a long term contract with a Machado or a Harper type, because there's no guarantee after 2019. But one question that I would have for you that that sees Goldschmidt all the time that covers this team. What do you think the value is even just in one year of having Paul Goldschmidt as a part of the team going forward? He is such a great baseball player. Defensively, offensively, he could steal bases. Now, he started off the season in a miserable slump. His first five, six weeks were terrible. And we thought this could be the decline right here, that maybe he just can't catch up to the fastball anymore. But he turned it around. He had more strikeouts this year than he's ever had before. And he didn't steal as many bases. And he didn't get to 100 RBIs. He got to 90. But he was able to rebound. If you look at some of his months after April, if you go look at what he did in May, June, July, he really carried the team for a while. And they were in first place almost every month of the season. I think the Cardinals are getting a great player. I mean, one of the best players in all of baseball, offensively and defensively. Now, he's not a vocal leader. He's a very quiet guy, keeps to himself. He doesn't have the best personality out there. He's not going to wow you or 
say anything fancy with quotes. He's just he's kind of a boring guy, but he's a great baseball player. So, I mean, the Cardinal fans are going to get a guy who, you know, really works hard every day. You'll never question his effort, ever. Never once will you question the effort that he puts out there on the field. The Cardinals have a bit of a reputation as a boring team, so maybe he'll fit right in. Um, one thing, though, I often have thought over this process in in – talking about this from the Cardinals perspective, I feel like Goldschmidt maybe is a little bit underrated at, in baseball as a whole, because this off season, you've got Harper and you've got Machado. You've got some of those guys that the whole baseball world has been building to their free agency years. I don't know that as many of the casual baseball fans perhaps see Goldschmidt often enough to really know how dynamic of a player he is on the field. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Yeah, you know, they, we call him America's first baseman over here. Um, but because he plays for a low-market team in a ballpark that's, you know, half-empty most of the time, and we're in a division with the Diamond, with the Dodgers and the Giants, and it, it's hard. It's hard to compete with a, a team like the Dodgers spending all that money. The, Do the Diamondbacks, they went up to about $140 million in their payroll this year. They, they can't sustain that. Um, not here in Arizona. I do think he's underappreciated, undervalued. But I think the other thing is he, he's 31 and I think one of the things that really, really hurt him is when he hits free agency next year, he'll be 32. And so you're going to have to pay him. Whoever decides to give him a five-year deal is going to pay him for 32, 33, 34, 35, maybe 36. You know, what kind of production are you going to get out of him then? So it's very, you know, you can't pay him based on what the last five years were. you got to pay him based on what you think the next five years are going to be. So it's going to be interesting to see what his value is. His value is, I mean, he's a $20, $25 million ball player right now, but is he going to be that in a year? Is he going to be that in two years? Is the decline starting for Paul Goldschmidt? You'll love him for a year. I'm sure he's going to put up fantastic numbers, and then it'll be interesting if the if the Cardinals re-sign him. Somebody's going to give him a lot of money, but it may be more of a three-year deal instead of a five-year deal. Yeah, that's been a big part of the conversation as far as what the future could be with him because um, he's certainly proven his worth, but there is a, a bit of a tipping point around that that part of someone's career where you're not quite sure if they're going to be as effective. Now, you mentioned at the beginning that um, th there's a bit of a rebuild going on for the Diamondbacks, oh, oh, yeah. um, to say the least, but what... What do you think the it's hard to lose a superstar, right? The fan base will see this and and feel the effects of the the emotional connection to baseball and to that particular player. Cardinals fans are are no strangers to this. Obviously lost Albert Pujols. A bit difference, a bit of a difference with free agency versus a trade, but nonetheless, the sting is still very real. So, what has the reaction been? What do you think um can be sort of the 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 silver lining, if you will, for for Diamondbacks fans? They're going to take it on the chin this year. I mean, no Corbin, no A.J. Pollock, no Goldie, and, you know, Jeff Mathis, their starting catcher is gone. Um, could be other trades. Like the Granke trade could happen. It's a possibility they'd like to move Granke and get off that $100 million contract, although they're going to have to eat some of it. I think the fans understand it's, it's tough. It's tough to lose a superstar. But, you know, Luis Gonzalez once walked away, and so did Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling after they won the World Series here, and, so we've seen it. Steve Nash, one of the great Suns players, went to the Lakers. I mean, that was really hard on the organization. They lost Keith Kachuk and Jeremy Roenick from the Coyotes. So, you know, we've, we've seen it happen quite a bit. You know, a few of them stay. Larry Fitzgerald has played his whole career with the Cardinals. This one is tough because he is a fan favorite. But I think that the knowledgeable baseball fans understood, got to let him go. Got to get something for him. They're going to get four players out of the Cardinals, four players. Is it their top prospects? No. Is it Dakota Hudson? No. They're not getting any of the top prospects. But they're getting a, a decent Major League starter in Weaver. They're getting a catcher. The Diamondbacks don't care about offense and catcher. So they're getting a catcher who's a really good defensive catcher. And, and they're excited about that. They're getting an infielder. And they're getting a, a draft pick in the 70s. So it'll be four players. Is it, is it quality over quantity? No. It's more quantity over quality. Um, in this trade, but they really needed to revamp their farm system a little bit. And they needed some players that were close to major league ready, which is what they got. They didn't get a bunch of guys that are in class a and that are three or four years away. They've got some players that are going to be able to come up and help them right away. 
Yeah, I was I was a Utah Jazz fan growing up, so I'm very familiar with a superstar going to LA when Carl Malone did it. Uh, young me was devastated. Um, but as far as the players that the Cardinals sent in this, I, I feel like it looks a little bit underwhelming on the surface, but I can tell you, Luke Weaver has huge potential. He may not be your top of the rotation guy. I know he had some struggles last year, lost some of the fastball changeup command, but when he, if he can sort that out, he's, he's the kind of guy that can be really steady and really reliable that you can count on. As you mentioned, Carson Kelly's a very strong defensive catcher and he was completely blocked in St. Louis. So I'm really excited to see what he can do without sort of playing under the shadow of Yadier Molina. Um, and then Andy Young is a guy that not a lot of people know much about, but our minor league guy at Birds on the Black, Kyle Reese, is is very high on Andy Young, just as a, a solid player, a pretty, pretty solid bat who can just be that kind of everyday guy um, if they need him to be. And then, of course, a draft pick. I mean, that's part of this rebuild process, right, is getting those picks so that you can build from the bottom up. Carson Kelly is probably the biggest piece for them. Although with Mike Hazen today, Mike Hazen said, look, we're looking for pitchers that could throw 200 innings, be part of the rotation. We're not looking at a one through five because it's probably, he's probably more of a three or a four. But he did pitch against the, the Diamondbacks last year on April 8th. Luke Weaver did. Threw six and a third inning, struck out seven, only gave up one run um, and three hits. Pitched a terrific game against them on April 8th. So we got a chance to see him firsthand, you know, against the Diamondbacks, and he had a really good game. Now, the Diamondbacks feel like there are, in talking to Mike Hazen today, the Diamondbacks feel like there are some things that they could do as an organization to get him back on track to being a, a really good, solid pitcher. So he may project as a four on some teams, maybe a three on others, but the Diamondbacks aren't looking at that right now. They're looking at, can this guy go out there and throw 200 innings for us? And that's what they're hopeful for. With Carson Kelly, Talking to Mike Hazen, this organization is all about defensive catchers. Pitch framing, defensive catching, they don't care about the offense. And he didn't really hit very well in the minor leagues, but there were some things about his offense that they did like. But the most important thing for them is defense. And they feel like they've got a and, and they lost Jeff Mathis. Uh, and there are other catchers, Alex Avila, and he's awful. And John Ryan Murphy, he's not very good either. So again, Carson Kelly, I think he's going to have a really good chance. As you mentioned, he was blocked by Yaddy and Molina. He wasn't going to play. So this is going to be an opportunity for him to come in and I think play right away. And he fits the mold of the defensive catcher that they want. I think at the end of the day, when you look at it, uh, it's a it's a great move for both of these teams, even if there is a little bit of a sting in, in seeing Paul Goldschmidt go. Last question for you. With all the years you've watched Goldschmidt covered this team, what's one story or or thing about Goldie that stands out? He likes to bowl. Does he? And he likes bowling. He does right. a bowling. He does a bowling charity event, and I was fortunate enough to be uh, be invited to go bowl in his charity event. So um, he's like, he, you're gonna you're gonna really like him, but he's not a great quote, and he's very boring, and he just goes about his business. So you're not. He's not gonna be the guy you go to for a great quote. He's gonna, you know, he, he never says anything that, that that's crazy. I'll, I'll, I'll say what I respect about him the most. His contract, I mean, he'll make $14.5 million this year. But you go look at what he's made the last three years based on his production. He never said a word. He never demanded a trade. He never, you know, asked for a new contract, uh, demanded a new contract. He just shut his mouth and he played baseball. And a lot of people respect that here because they knew based on his production that he was really, really underpaid based on what his value is. Never said a peep to anybody. So you'll you'll like that about him. He'll go out there and just be a, go about his business, play baseball every day. But he does like to bowl a little bit. So you know, you can throw a couple of strikes now and then. Carlos Martinez uh, has a bowling charity event every year too, and he's got more personality than any one person needs. So maybe they'll balance each other out. <laughs> they could. Maybe we'll have dueling bowling charity events between the two of them. There you go. There you go. Well, I appreciate you taking a little bit of time. I'm sure that it has been. Uh, quite, like I said, quite the week with all the things that have happened thus far and will continue to be. So I uh, appreciate you taking a few minutes. All right, Tara. Thank you. Take care. Thanks again to Gambo for joining me. You can hear him on Arizona Sports 98.7 in Phoenix if you're ever out that way. Um, and if you are, you should visit Cardinal Gifts because I think he gets that station. Nonetheless, thank you for coming on and talking about this massive deal. Let me know what you all think of Paul Goldschmidt as a Cardinal and the players they had to trade in order to get him. 
coming up this weekend, I will have a full episode with the one and only Craig Mish. So make sure you check back in for that. Hopefully there are more things to talk about, at least heading into the winter meetings. Until then, I'll see you next time.